I'm Hannah Kay. I'm delighted to introduce you to Marie Chasseau, who is joining us from Geneva today. Hi, Marie. Hi, how are you, Hannah? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good. Hello, um, everyone. Yeah, hi, everyone. So I'd just love to introduce you to Marie. So Marie is a brand and business strategy di director. Um, her area of expertise is sustainable luxury. She's ex-CEO of Baum, which was the, or is, the world's first sustainable watch brand owned by Richemont Groom. She's got uh, an incredibly illustrious career in watches and luxury. Um, so today we are going to be talking about the future of sustainable luxury. Our other panelists sadly had a few tech issues, uh, Marie-Cécile Cervellon. So she'll be joining us at another time. So uh, Marie, thank you. Um, let's uh, let's begin. So I really want to take it back to basics and nail down. You know, why is it? Why do people buy luxury items? What is luxury in this respect? Okay. So the first part of the question, I think that the the relationship of customers with luxury has become more complex uh, recently. I think that it used to be, I buy luxury items, so I am. Mm. And now it is more, I buy luxury products because I am special, because I'm unique and I'm mm. interesting. And actually, I think that the brands should also think that I'm interesting and should it be interested in me. Mm. And and this is, a, this is a, I think, a fundamental evolution of uh, of the reason why the, the, the people would buy luxury. Mm -hmm. And to, to what comes to the definition of luxury, of course, there is an evolution of the definition throughout the ages. And, mm -hmm. uh, and also depending on the people who define the, the world luxury or the notion of luxury. But I think that there is um, a red thread uh, that is rarity. Mm -hmm. uh, scarcity uh, and that that defines very well luxury and in in the context where we live and and especially because I am very concerned about about the evolution brands and, and the world and the and the planet uh, takes mm -hmm. I think that um, in the context of the the natural resources depletion mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the constant urbanization of, of this world I think that ecology or sustainability call it uh, how you want uh, has to be part of the definition of luxury uh, mm -hmm. now and in the future, uh, if not to be the definition of luxury. And and this this word of uh, rarity, I think, really very well um, uh, explain luxury throughout all the, mm -hmm. the, the ages. Absolutely. And I was thinking about, you know, your background in watches. And traditionally, watches have been very much a classic luxury status symbol. You know, do you think that this is still the case with Gen Z and millennial consumers? I think it's. I think it definitely became very, very challenging and very tricky. I, I'm not saying here that uh, watches will disappear as a status symbol because I don't believe it. Because I, first of all, if we take, uh, for instance, the the, the, the male consumers, they, they don't have so many items they can buy mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and I think that it will remain something in, in, in somehow a way for, for people to express their, uh, their, their status or also to express their values. But I think mm -hmm. it very much depends on, uh, and this is one of the biggest challenge I think of luxury brands and especially also of, of watchmaking brands because watchmaking industry remained very traditional and mm -hmm. conservative in a way. And I think one of the big challenge is how the brands will reinvent, reinvent themselves in order to be relevant to these to these consumers who have mm -hmm. totally disrupted uh, the, the all the industry and, and luxury industry in particular with their, their new expectations and 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 the, their new way of of, uh, of, of consuming and um, and behaving. Um, can you think of any other watch brands that are doing this particularly well, um, that you see changes, you know, real positive changes being made towards sustainability? Well, I think that it's, it's, it's still very, um, I think that the, the watch brands are, are still very shy on, the, mm. on, this, on this aspect, on this prospect. But I, I know uh, for a fact that uh, some some big groups, some 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 of the 
watchmaking brands uh, have this concern but when it when it goes to transform a business it's it's quite challenging it's quite difficult mm. but i still think that that watchmaking industry is behind in term in terms of uh, of uh, sustainability if you take for instance fashion where there is still a lot of work to do i think that uh, they are not at the same stage of awareness mm. and of action to take so it's difficult to to it's difficult to mention one particular brand, yeah. uh, but I think that uh, there are a few brands out there that that are really uh, uh, status brands and uh, mm. and they still uh, and they still very strong even though they are not mm. they are not really taking sustainability into mm. into account. That's interesting, you know, that so watches are still very much in the kind of research and development stage of sustainability as opposed to yeah. Um, perhaps ready to wear fashion, which is in some ways slightly more ahead of the curve. But even yeah. saying that, um, many of the luxury brands don't still don't have sort of full transparency about their supply chains either. So there's definitely more work to do. Um, a lot of work, yes. What are this? What are some of the ways luxury brands can incorporate sustainable practices into their design and manufacturing? The, the, there is <laughs> there are plenty of ways, and that's the good news. I think that it really goes from from A to Z throughout the whole uh, the whole process and the whole yeah. value chain. But but I think that it's interesting that the, you mentioned first the design because it's it's where it it's where it starts, and and it's really the 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 point zero where you can where a brand can can act really and act. Uh, an action that that will have effects on all the throughout the whole value chain mm. the design has has also the design approach has to be transformed mm. uh, because it has to be it's no longer the designer sitting at sitting at his uh, his his or her table and and designing and uh, and creating by his own i think it's uh, it's definitely now um important to to be more inclusive and collaborative mm. so it means that all stakeholders have to be involved in order to define the best product that will have the less impact possible. Because mm -hmm. it has, of course, the design of a product has consequences over, over the, the supply chain, the choice of material, the end of life mm -hmm. of, uh, of the product. And all these, these aspects are very important in order mm -hmm. to, to, to make a brand more sustainable. Absolutely. And I think um, just from my personal experience, teaching at the London College of Fashion, all of the courses, every single pathway, there is now a sustainable element to the design. So um, I'm hopeful that if that's the case in London, that that must be being mirrored at design schools around the world. You know, it's. I think yes, I think definitely, and this is very, I think, a very positive evolution, and I agree with you because I, I also. Um, uh, run a, a project with a uh, with a design school in uh, in London, and actually the young designers, the young generation of designers, they are they are definitely very well prepared mm -hmm. uh, to to really take this, this their role as the designers of the future, and uh, and they strongly believe in it as well. And they are very uh, they are very critical. They are very challenging. Of course, obviously obviously they are Gen Z and Gen Y yeah. generations, so they they really. Uh, uh, embody all these values of uh, authenticity, transparency, and so on. But it's, I, I, I have to say that it's very encouraging to to be uh, to be in contact with with yeah. um, these schools and and these people because uh, out there it's it's not always uh, good news that we that we receive. But uh, I think we can be confident yeah. in in at, at least uh, for for the the future designers. Things to look forward to. Um, so what are some of the challenges facing a luxury brand in terms of sustainability? Why has it not happened perhaps as rapidly as it should have done? Mm. Um, I think that the, the, first, uh, the first challenge uh, is definitely about the mindset. Mm. Because I think that uh, transforming a, an existing brand, uh, trying to embed uh, sustainability into uh, the brand that sometimes exists for 100 to 200 years is, is, a, is a very big challenge because mm -hmm. you have, of course, to, to preserve and maintain the DNA of the brand while at the same time embedding uh, the, you know, the reality and the challenge mm -hmm. of, of today's world. 
but the biggest challenge I think is really about the mindset because it has to be uh, this, this journey has to be understood from from the top to the to the to the bottom by everyone by every stakeholder otherwise it, it doesn't really work because it's it's so much into details it's so much into the the, the general way of seeing business uh, and and uh, and the process and and the production and the consumption that if if people are not ready to to really embrace this evolution it's mm. it's very complicated and it's so it's internal mindset but i would say also the external mindset mm. because customers also have their role to play they also have to evolve they they make they make the evolution happen it it comes from also from gen z and y and and the young generations who ask for this but but at the same time we have all uh, um you know all type of customers who are not aware or not are not concerned about sustainability. So they also have their role to play in order to evolve in the way they, con they, they consume and they behave. And I think that's interesting what you said about, you know, it's, it's also about communicating that mindset. So in terms of marketing, um, you know, to what extent do you think that sustainability has become a bit of a buzzword? And, you know, to what extent are luxury brands slightly greenwashing their consumers? Um, <laughs> yeah yes it, it has be, it has definitely definitely become a buzzword and uh for 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 the the good and the bad mm -hmm. i think that um of course when we talk about buzz buzz sustainability we 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 come to greenwashing mm -hmm. and i think that unfortunately uh, you know i think that there are different categories of brands embracing or or, or kicking off this journey towards sustainability and uh, and those who who don't really believe in it they they are they are in in a way greenwashing because what they would do is um you know for instance okay this is this is something we have to do this is uh this is a necessity in order to make sure that we don't lose some customers yeah. so let's do a collaboration with a sustainable brand let's do a, a capsule collection yeah. and let's massively communicate on this which is totally yeah but it, it's exactly yeah. what, hap it's what happens about what's happening and the Yes, and it's very confusing for, for consumers because it's very difficult, and I think that this is also one also of the challenge of sustainability is 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 to because it's a complex topic uh, how to 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 make this information clear and understandable mm -hmm. for the consumers as well, and how to how to really sort out the the information that is that is greenwash mm -hmm. greenwashing uh, customers and and how to to make sure that uh, the the to make sure that that the brands are authentic and and are true to their to to the the way they do yeah. they do things absolutely and i was wondering how can consumers be better informed about a company's sustainable practices where can people find out this information i think this is this is one of the of the big issue because i think we've you probably do as well i've been through this journey of understanding personally in order to make sure that I can consume uh, more uh, mindfully that I can be more aware and I think that this is something that is that is coming more and more we you can find plenty of uh, of blogs websites and, and to in order to to understand but there's still a, a, a lot of uh, the lo a lot of, of work to do and I'm actually working on on a, on a project mm -hmm. exactly exactly about this uh, about how to 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 make people understand to to also um, mm -hmm. also try to translate these very complex uh, topics into something that is mm -hmm. that is understandable that is and 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 you know I think one of the of the issues also of sustainability is the way um, we are making consumers feeling guilty mm -hmm. and I, I don't think it's the right way to approach things i think that we have on the contrary to make people feel feel good about it and just make people understand that it's something uh, that is part of an evolution and that you cannot be perfect from day yeah. one and try to find and provide the consumers with real solutions that are feasible that has that are applicable um, for them uh, and and just not make them feel guilty and make them feel that they are uh, 
uh, destroying the world mm. and then this is i don't think it's uh, the, the good uh, approach but i think more and more that the the we, we will see uh we will see uh initiatives mm. uh e towards you know making people understand better and and being informed absolutely i know there's there's one good resource we use at the university which is the fashion revolution transparency index um, yes so i know that that's one but that's True. really just one yeah. resource and and they, yeah, and they are also when it comes to food, for instance, there are a lot of uh, of uh, applications where where you can go and scan the 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 food in order to because this is one of the uh, this is one of the tricky thing about about uh, sustainability and for for instance is the the bio food. Mm -hmm. Um, you can go in a in a bio a whole bio foods and you can you can tag all the 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 things. It doesn't mean that it, it's that it's because it's written bio on the yeah. item that it's good for your health, yeah. and and this is where it's very complicated for consumers to to understand this. No, it's the same thing. You know, um, an, uh, a garment might you know say made in the UK or made in France or made in Italy, but where the fabrics come from, you know, you still don't know uh, the yeah. supply chain that it's passed through. And transparency, I think, is still something that's quite a problem um, in all aspects of the fashion Absolutely. industry. And for what comes to, to watchmaking, because we mentioned yeah. watchmaking, uh, this is also definitely, you know, there is a whole big question around Swiss made because mm -hmm. you can be Swiss made, but it doesn't mean that you don't manufacture a lot of things out of uh, outside of yeah. Switzerland. So the final yeah. assembly is so, just uh, <laughs> made in, in Switzerland. Um, yeah. So uh, I just wanted to move on to an interesting, what I think is an interesting topic about luxuries. Uh, Secondhand luxury items, and the fact that uh, luxury items hold their value, and in some instances increase their value as time goes on. Uh, moving away from this capitalist idea that it's got to be new to be better, and actually valuing secondhand items and the history and provenance of secondhand items. Um, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, again, one one very good example um, in the watch industry is the fact that uh, there are not plenty of them, but at least two brands mm -hmm. that really are, are, you know, getting more values once you've bought the watch. It's it's Patek mm -hmm. Philippe and, uh, and Rolex. When uh, you see the amount uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, a watch can reach in the in auction, it's it's a it's a very good example. But it's it's still a, minor, a minority mm -hmm. of of watches. It will maybe evolve i hope so uh, because i think this is definitely part of uh, circular economy and uh, and the good way the good direction we have to to, yeah. to take and but i think that yes more and more but maybe people will value the the history behind because behind the the, the mm -hmm. object behind the the item and also uh, value the the quality because only only a good manufactured product uh, a luxury product or at least really well manufactured product can last in time so this goes also mm -hmm. with, with you know with the fact that probably people will consume less and and hold uh, things longer mm -hmm. so yeah definitely it's part also of the evolution of mindset because i think that that we definitely move we have definitely to move from fast fashion to to second hand and reuse and resell and everything and, and it's part also of, uh, of the evolution of, of mindset and it but it yeah it will take some yeah some time also in the in the mind of consumers to like you say um for that to work as a sustainable business model the idea of um having an economy of second hand goods um very much depends on the quality and craftsmanship in the first place yeah. so you know it should be you know but brands building in this idea of durability into their products um mm -hmm. and yes and i think that also and this is also an element that has to be taken into account and and that for instance when we built the the, the boom uh, the boom watch brand we took into account is how we can make sure that the design is timeless mm -hmm. enough to, to, to make sure that it will last in time also in terms of, uh, of aesthetic mm -hmm. and, and design. And, uh, and that's also one of the, of the big strengths of, of luxury is that this timelessness mm -hmm. and, and the fact that it's, it, never, it never holds in terms yeah. of, uh, of 
uh, yeah, fashion or fashionability? Or... Um, I think that's, you know, obviously that's very true in watches and accessories, but I think that's an interesting conversation at the moment in fashion ready to wear, the idea of creating trans seasonality to collections. Um, so if we're going to look at kind of post pandemic fashion, you know, will we see slightly less directional trends coming through um, and slower drops as well? Absolutely, that's a that's a very good point. It's because it's it's something that can be totally uh, applicable to fashion as well. But it's it was not in the mindset yeah. because usually the the fashion brand, the luxury brands, have to dictate in a way what is fashion and to dictate how what is cool and mm -hmm. what is nice and and what is not. So I think it's yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. evolution, and it's uh, it's one way for 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 the for the for the cloth brand to uh, to hold a little bit the, the pace mm -hmm. of our collections. And, uh... um, just jumping in at that point, I'd love to invite the audience to put any questions they have in the chat box, um, talking about the future of sustainable luxury. If you have any questions for Marie or myself, please do get involved. We'd love to hear from you. Um, hopefully you can all see the chat box. Um, so just moving on, Marie, uh, I wanted to talk a bit about the benefits and pitfalls for luxury brands in adopting an omni-channel strategy. So obviously, we've seen a massive rise in e-commerce since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's a very uh, sort of, you know, topical discussion. How do luxury brands best connect their bricks and mortar to their digital uh platforms yeah what are your thoughts on this but i i think that that definitely the benefits are obvious it's it's uh it's a way to uh to diversify and multiply the, the touch points with mm -hmm. the customers so of course obviously it's a it's a commerce uh discussion um for what for what concerns pitfalls mm -hmm. i think that i see at least three the one is the um, the risk for for brands and we can see that uh, out there the, the risk for brands to remain in this approach of channel centric thinking which we can see in the whole, in you know throughout the whole organization and i think that the the, the question of channels has disappeared now I, I, consumers don't mm -hmm. see channels anymore they don't think you know channel wise yeah. So I think it's all blur, and I think that the brands have to adapt to this reality, otherwise they will have some some issues. Um, I think that another one is the risk to to diffuse too much let's see, um, their efforts um, and trying to be, you know, everything, everywhere mm -hmm. for everyone. And and this can be very very costly and inefficient. So they really have to seek for a strategy that is relevant, and uh, a customer relevant and and uh, uh, remarkable in order to stand out. And um, and another another I think uh, challenging aspect of this omni omni channel strategy is um, the cost of uh, a very. Um, harmonious and coherent experience throughout all the channels and this can be very very mm -hmm. costly um and and in one also um uh, inefficient uh, inefficient results i think traditionally luxury brands were quite hesitant to jump into the digital sphere as well this is a, this is a very good uh, observation because definitely i think that this one one of the industry to be last uh, especially luxury mm -hmm. high-end watches to be last. I, I remember, you know, the, the discussions we had uh, with the, the boards and, and, and it was, I mean, it was a, a no-brainer that never uh, or, or luxury watch brand will, will go on the, on the e-commerce. Of course, it evolved a lot, but they, it took a, l a very mm -hmm. long time. But when we can, we, we look back at the, you know, at the past, I think that uh, on every mega trend, on every uh, disruption in in history, watchmaking industry was not the first one to yeah. react. It was it was lacking a, a bit of resilience mm. and, and and reactivity. So we've got, to watch, um... but in the end, they, they <laughs> <do>. <laughs> um, you know, it really is that idea of how do you take incredibly sort of 
you know, this incredible craftsmanship. I've been to Glashute, I've been to the factories, I've seen the history behind it. How do you make that incredibly modern and forward thinking? Um, so we've got a question from Laurent, who's so question for you, Marie. Do you know of a brand that does the omni-channel strategy well, in your opinion? A brand in general? Um, or... Any luxury brand, I think. We'll <laughs> let's take a stab at that. Well, do um, so I see that? Uh, I think fashion brands are more yeah, ahead of, I would agree. of, uh, of the yeah definitely i think uh, um yeah fashion brands uh, i mean i don't think sorry to just jump in um, i think no. burberry does this uh well um yes. so obviously a heritage it. brand um they've evolved quite well um and their sort of art of trench uh campaign which used a lot of uh customer or consumer generated content um the campaign launched by uh scott shawman of the sartorialist so they kind of took that idea of heritage and then asked their customer base to show them via social media um how they were styling their trench coats for example it's just one and also doing their pop-up um showrooms like the one they did in london the maker's house I don't know if you went to that, but sort of having this idea of a gallery plus a social media campaign plus their normal um, flagship stores as well. But, you know, like you said, I can't think of any, so many watch brands, um, perhaps. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't identify one particular watch brand. Um, but, um, but yeah, in, in fashion, I think more, uh, there, are, there are more examples like mm. maybe Gucci as well. We can, yeah, we can absolutely. Um, so talking a bit about personalization um, in the future of luxury and fashion accessories, this is a hot topic. So how important do you think personalization is going to be for the next generation of consumers? Um, yes, uh, I agree. Personalization uh, has been a, a very big, a very big trend uh, that we can that we can observe for for the, the past years. Um, I think that it's part of uh, the expectations of the new consumers because they definitely want to to feel special mm -hmm. and unique, while at the same time being part of a community, mm -hmm. a tribe. So this is. It, in a way, a contradiction, mm -hmm. but but it, but it, it leaves a lot of I think a lot of uh, uh, room for creativity mm -hmm. for for the brands, um, and but I think that personalization uh, is is not has to be really thought in terms of also mm -hmm. of experience. I don't think it's enough to propose to offer to customers to put initials mm -hmm. on the item they bought or to choose, you know, between yeah. a few colors. I don't think this is personalization. I think that um, the customer has to take the hand and it, it, he, he or she really has to participate to yeah. the creation and the definition of, of his or her items because it definitely adds an, an, an emotional connection, an additional emotional connection to the item. And ultimately, I think that personalization is, is a way for brands also to take into account mm. sustainability. Coming back to the discussion we had, I think that uh, having this emotional link with the item, having, you know, uh, participate to the creation, mm. the definition of the product really probably will encourage people to yeah. keep them yeah. or to give it to, to the to the their loved ones or at least keep it uh, and uh, and maybe to keep it longer than than other items and to pre prevent them from from buying mm. on a, on a, you know um, uh, constantly on a very bulimic mm -hmm. uh, how do you say that in english but uh, um so this is one aspect the other one about personalization i think is is uh, has to do with the 
with um, how much the, um, the brands are producing. And I think this is about stock management. So personalizing objects and, and asking upfront to the customers what, what they would like and maybe asking also asking mm -hmm. them to wait for a while, which is absolutely not a problem when it has uh, when it has a reason. I think it, it can help also brands to, to better manage their, their stock level, which is yeah. a, a disaster in, in, as we all know, in fashion industry, but not only in fashion industry, in the washmaking industry as well. And, uh, and this, is, this is a major, one of the major advantages. And this is one of the things you pioneered with Baum, really, wasn't it? The idea that you could fully, you know, pretty much fully customize your watch and it was all made to order. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. The whole idea was was to really to be able to uh, to to manage the the stock level, to to have uh, parts of the watches which in, can be reused in a, in a, in another way or other combinations, and making sure that there is no uh, stock destruction in the end, which was which is and and I I know that this is an issue that is uh, being tackled by the mm -hmm. by the industry, but uh, there was. Uh, uh, an, amount, an amazing amount of watches that were destroyed um, because it mm -hmm. was uh, overstock. And once the, the watch has gone through the distribution, retail, uh, and and then the the the, the you know the the, the gray markets and and maybe the the staff sales and everything, there is still an, an immense amount mm -hmm. of watches uh, that are that are thrown away or destroyed. Yeah. And this like, is a disaster. Well, so that's why one of the issues uh, we, we decided to address with yeah. uh, personalization. Um, what projects are you working on at the moment? Can you talk about any of those? Um, I am actually accompanying uh, you know, companies uh, in their journey mm -hmm. towards uh, sustainability. Um, and I am also working on, on a, a project um, that has the ambition to build an ecosystem of all stakeholders, all actors um, involved or interested at you know all different levels by sustainability mm. and the evolution to towards sustainability. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, That's great. So you're very much committed to this area of the luxury industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Just one final question, really. I was wondering if you could change one thing about the luxury industry, what would it be? Um, that's a good. That's a very good question. I think it's it's uh, it's applicable not only to luxury industry, but I think that as soon as uh, people, uh, and in particular leaders and owners and uh, and board members, will have understood that business can and must mm. be a force for good and that ultimately purpose and i'm quoting uh, here i'm quoting uh, uh, larry fink from uh, the black black rock uh, mm -hmm. investment fund that ultimately purpose is the engine of uh, the engine of a long-term mm. profitability mm -hmm. i think that we will have a way to uh, to to prepare and, or to at least preserve the future of uh, of next generations and this is this is for me. It's important because I I still think that, and I can understand that uh, that we we are not at the same stage of of understanding and and uh, and commitment to sustainability. But I think when we talk the language of uh, the old world, which I which I call the old world, um, and we talk about the fact that sustainability can can def is definitely uh, the way mm -hmm. to profitability. Um, yeah, I think and the first step message. on that path is purpose. Is purpose, um, exactly. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your insightful expertise. I'd love to...